As uh, the President has said, this is my first time appearing before your conference as Chief Inspector of Constabulary, but not the first time I've been here. One of the first things that I did when I had been confirmed after the Select Committee um, confirmation hearing uh, as uh, Chief Inspector of Constabulary, one of the first things I did was I met with the Executive Committee of the Police Superintendents Association of England and Wales and asked them for their advice as to how I should approach uh, the responsibilities and the functions of this role. And the advice that I received was generously given and was extremely valuable to me. Chief Superintendent Thomas has just given a most eloquent review of the challenges faced by the police service uh, in the year gone by. From the interview that he gave to Police Oracle a few days ago, I know he referred to the superintending ranks as having a Janus role, in that they are both managerial and command responsible responsibilities. Just to continue the theme, the Roman god Janus with his two faces, of course, looks both forwards and backwards. And that's what I'm going to do today by touching briefly on the last year. I've been in office for almost a year and our dual responsibility at HMIC of facing both towards the public and the police service. And then I'll finish my remarks by looking forward to the inspection program of 2013-14 and giving you some new information about two of the major inspections which we will be doing. But just looking backwards, as I said, I've now been in post for almost a year and my time as uh, Chief Inspector Constabulary and therefore HMIC itself has been very busy. We have published thematic reports on a range of issues, including on police integrity, the use of stop and search powers, and our progress against the 2012 report on undercover policing. We've published joint reports with our fellow criminal justice inspectorates on various aspects of the criminal justice system, including the use of Section 136 of the Mental Health Act 1983, and the ways in which cases of disability hate crime are handled, and the inefficiencies of the criminal justice system, something that we'll be at, uh, we will be attending to, no doubt, for years to come. We've also uh, dealt with four specific reports, which include reviews on the historical inquiries work in Northern Ireland, the response to child protection in Northamptonshire, crime recording in Kent, and domestic abuse in Essex. Police and crime commissioners have begun to exercise their statutory powers to ask HMIC to inspect. Our first of these was on crime recording in Kent, and it was published in June 2013. Others are coming in. We've also published on the 18th of July our annual value for money report for 2012-13, which showed that forces are rising to the financial challenge of the spending review, crime is down, victim satisfaction is up, and the front line is being protected as much as possible. This is greatly to the credit of the police service, although we also raised concerns about the ability of some forces to respond to future funding cuts uh, which I'll mention later. Now looking forward, the inspections that we will be doing over the next six months will be considerable and extremely important. But before I go into them, I want to talk briefly about the dual role of HMIC of facing towards the public and facing towards the police. As you know, I used to be an economic regulator for another safety critical monopoly public service. And there is a tendency of the providers of services to look at things from the point of view of the producer and not the consumer. That's understandable. That's why we have regulators and inspectorates. HMIC does not do that. In what we will do, we will always look at policing from the point of view of the consumer, the public. HMIC inspects in the public interest. We are the public's eyes and ears on the police service. And we will continue to intensify our focus on what matters most to the public. For far too long, HMIC was thought by some 
and in relation to recent years, quite wrongly, but it was thought by some to be the police talking to the police. My first year in office, and as I've got my feet under the table and dealt with my colleagues, has confirmed beyond all doubt that this is incorrect and in recent years was incorrect. But it was what some people thought. HMIC represents and talks to and champions the public first and foremost. And that can't be emphasized enough. It is of the greatest importance that the public know that there is an independent, authoritative, objective, and professional organization serving their interests by inspecting and reporting on the police, its efficiency and effectiveness. Those are the statutory criteria given to us under the County and Borough Police Act 1856 and reenacted since. It has been unchanged. It is HMIC's core purpose and it hasn't changed at all. But things have changed at HMIC. HMIC has a more direct link with the public. As I've mentioned, we're carrying out commissions from the elected police and crime commissioners. We are continuing to increase the amount of public survey work which supports our inspections. We have involved thousands, tens of thousands of people in our reports. And in the Stop and Search and Valuing the Police 3 reports, it involved us questioning over 19,000 people. The inspection program for 2013-14 highlights how we are working for the public. We look at areas of policing of the greatest interest to the public. The people the police are sworn to protect, the people the police are privileged to protect. In June this year, we published our inspection program for 2013-14. Since then, we have received two further 43 force commissions from the Home Secretary, one to look at domestic abuse, which I'll mention in a bit, and one to look at undercover policing. Our program of work is moving forward at some pace, and some of the developments which I can tell you about for the first time today include domestic abuse and child sexual exploitation. If you search online with the terms killed by partner or ex-partner, a depressing, a more than depressing, an appalling number of stories come up. Home Office statistics show that on average, two women per week and seven men per quarter are killed in the UK as a result of domestic violence. And 40 to 60% of all domestic abuse reports are made by repeat victims. Home Office reports an estimated 1.2 million women experienced domestic violence last year. Of that 1.2 million, around 400,000 were sexually assaulted, including an estimated 85,000 rapes, and thousands more were subjected to stalking. 75% of all children on child protection plans come from families that have experienced domestic abuse. The effect of these dreadful statistics on the police, apart from the fact that they represent a blow against the police's central tenet, which is to protect people, is also stark. Eight to 10% of the overall demand for police resources is domestic abuse related. And domestic violence accounts for one out of every seven reported crimes of violence. Because of the clear public interest in ensuring that the police are dealing with, and wherever possible, preventing domestic abuse, the Home Secretary announced last Friday that she has commissioned HMIC to conduct a thematic review in this area. And whilst domestic abuse effectively requires a range of agencies and partners to work together, the emphasis of HMIC's inspection will be on the police action with a particular focus on victim care. Our terms of reference require us to assess and report on the effectiveness of the police approach to domestic violence and abuse, to assess whether victims who are at risk of violence in the future 
are appropriately managed, whether the police are learning from past experience and adapting their responses, and whether any changes need to be made to the overall approach of the police. All 43 forces will be inspected, and we are consulting now on our approach with a view to starting fieldwork in October 2013 and completing all inspections before Christmas. A national thematic report and 43 individual reports will be published by April 2014. The second inspection I'd like to talk about in the time I have is that of the police response to child sexual exploitation. Our review earlier this year into allegations and intelligence material concerning Jimmy Savile received between 1964 and 2012, and it was published in March this year, was the first part of our work on child sexual exploitation. High profile and horrific recent cases such as those in Oxford, Telford and Yorkshire demonstrate, should there be any need to do so, the continuing need to focus on this critical area of protecting the most vulnerable people in our communities, our children. A few weeks ago, I met Detective Chief Inspector Alan Edwards, who was SIO in the Telford case. Now, the facts of that case are truly horrifying, and DCI Edwards has today given me a paper on the matters which he believes deserve the most close attention, which are the most important in cases of this kind, and I'm grateful to him for that. We will be, of course, receiving information from many other sources. Tragically, the internet has provided new ways for this kind of abuse to take place. Those of us who have children will know that their online lives are increasingly as important as their offline lives. Ofcom research from 2012 showed that 12 to 15 year olds are spending as much time on the internet, 17 hours a week, as they do watching television, with one in 10 three to four year olds using a tablet computer at home, according to their parents. Just last Thursday, I read the article on the BBC website with Detective Superintendent Ewan Wilson of Essex Police, in which he revealed that seven child sex cases, each with multiple victims, have been investigated by Essex Police in the last 12 months. I'll take this opportunity to quote his words from his article as an example of the changing nature of this kind of offence. Detective Superintendent Ewan Wilson said, stranger danger, as it was once known, is now extremely rare. Instead, he said, Child abuse is often carried out by known people or online. The cases dealt with recently included the grooming of a number of vulnerable children so that they could be sexually abused and even prostituted. The abuse, he says, often begins with abusers identifying a victim of about 12 or 13 years old, the age that parental influence begins to loosen, and then befriending them in person or online. The victim is then given gifts, often a mobile phone, because that gives the abuser access to the child. Later, the victim is taken to parties, introduced to drugs and alcohol, and the sexual exploitation then begins. Because of this kind of tragic trend, I can today announce that the next stage of HMIC's inspection of the police response to child sexual exploitation will look at internet grooming and internet-based child offending in this area. We've already carried out a pilot study and we will visit another eight forces in October and November this year with a view to publishing a thematic report in March 2014. There has been considerable support for this inspection from the police service for which we give our very great gratitude. And responses to consultation from forces and other stakeholders have been overwhelmingly constructive and supportive. Thank you. The sort of cases I've just described in relation to the grooming of children online represents the worst of the internet. 
Of course, the internet offers us much that is good, and that includes offering the police huge opportunities in terms of intelligence and information. But the police are, in some cases, struggling to harness this power to best effect. That is in no small part down to the problems with the IT hardware which is available to the police, something I've rehearsed in public several times before and, I which, and which I know you, of all audiences I've addressed, know very well indeed. Meanwhile, as society debates the parameters between real life and online life, the police are left to dealt with its worst excesses. Some of these excesses are visible to all of us, such as the vicious trolling of public figures or racist or homophobic remarks. Others, as we have seen with child sexual exploitation, are hidden deep in what is termed the dark web. The police are expected to deal with both of these kinds of offending, whilst at the same time their responsibility to deal with traditional offending, the burglaries, violence, antisocial behavior, and so on, still weighs heavily upon them. The inspectorate is keenly aware that the police need to adapt to new challenges, whilst also shouldering continuing responsibilities, and that comes at a time when the service is becoming smaller. The spending announcement in June 20, uh, in, sorry, in June 20, uh, 13, shows that the police will have to find further savings. The reality is that most of the money spent by the police is spent on its people, 80% and more. And so less money means continued pressure on police numbers and requiring greater efficiency and effectiveness from a diminishing service, diminishing in numbers. There are also indications that these changes are having a particular effect on the superintending ranks. In our report valuing the police three, we reported how staff associations raised with us issues in relation to operational and personal resilience, particularly at superintendent and chief superintendent ranks, which from March 2010 to March 2013 have reduced by 20% and 22% respectively. Superintendents in some places, perhaps in all places, are already on call more often, less able to take rest days, and increasingly carrying multiple onerous responsibilities. We understand that, and we attach considerable weight to those pressures and those factors. Now I'd like to talk about how we will inspect. This is another example of HMIC's dual role, if I haven't already exhausted the Janus metaphor. We shine a light not only on how the police are responding to the types of offending the public think are important, but also on the enormous challenges that they face. But let me emphasize this. HMIC is not in existence only to criticize the police even though the negatives are, of course, more often reported than the positives. We also play a part in highlighting good practice and ensuring that we provide transparent information about the good work which is done in one area so that the public and their elected representatives can see whether or not it matches what they see in the area where they live. That is also in the public interest. The good and the bad in all our inspections, we will not flinch from saying what needs to be said. It is not for the inspectorate to hide either what the police do or the enormous challenges that they face behind any kind of smokescreen, not one constructed of political sensitivities or official obfuscations. Crime and the harm it does need to be talked about in the language which people understand and, and can relate to the sometimes grievous wrongs which have been done to them. Anything else does their, serve, their, does their suffering a disservice. So we will continue to proceed on the basis of hard evidence, a rigid adherence to the facts. We will give fair and honest judgments 
based on the best evidence available. We do not seek to influence through judgments which are based on suspicion or speculation or on the advice of those without expertise. But it's not a one-way process. It requires that we be given quality data and information on which to base our assessments and our judgments. And as the senior operational commanders of the police service, this is a responsibility which falls in large measure upon you. We will also continue to listen to you, the police service. The position of HMIC is one of independence, objectivity, and fairness. I've said this before, I repeat it here. Some inspection findings will be unpopular with the police service at several or all levels. They will be unpopular with home office ministers and officials. They will be unpopular with police and crime commissioners and maybe with other stakeholders. But we will never shy away from making judgments and telling the public of them. May I just emphasize this? Political considerations form no part of our statutory criteria. I've looked, I've looked very hard. There's nothing in there right back to 1856. There is no special emphasis or undue weight in any of them. We operate in and for the public interest, and that's it, and it's never going to change. To conclude, I began by speaking of Janus's role of looking in two ways, both backwards and forwards. Janus is also the god of thresholds, and so the god of change, from old to new, from past to present. So there's no doubt that he is an apt figure to talk about in relation to policing, because a lot of change has happened. As was said earlier, any suggestion that the police is the last unreformed public service might have been true years ago, but it certainly isn't true today, because I think the police, as a public service, has probably undergone more change in the last three to five years than any other public service and it's certainly undergone more change than it has ever gone through since it was established, the modern police service was established by Peel in 1829. So there's been a lot of change, we can agree about that. And the changes are significant ones. The College of Policing, the National Crime Agency, Police and Crime Commissioners, the biggest by far single change, but also significant financial restraints. And criminals and the way in which they commit crimes are changing continually, including by using the internet and new social media. And of course, concurrently, you, the police service, now have new ways of fighting crime and gathering intelligence to combine with the centuries-old skills of the police in investigating and detecting crime. It is your ability to adapt and to evolve, to look both forward and back, which makes you so successful. The British model of policing, it's been said often, I am in no doubt it bears repeating, both in the past and the present is the best in the world. And your exemplary ability as a service to make difficult cuts whilst victim satisfaction continues to rise and recorded crime to fall bears ever more forensic witness to this. So I've looked back over a year in which the service has proved itself to be rising successfully to the financial challenge whilst working to tackle new problems and looking forward to talking, and I'm looking forward to talking to you much more in the years ahead about the fascinating, difficult, and crucial work of the police service in England and Wales, work which deserves the highest international recognition as well as public recognition in this country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Tom Windsor. Tom has indicated that it'll take questions. I think we have a few minutes left. We've got Tom, we've got Nora and David. Could you make yourselves uh, known to where you are with the microphones? Tom, Nora and David, stand up, make yourselves known where you are. I've got a gentleman down here with a question, first of all. Uh, old familiar face, good to see you again. 
Uh, remind us who you are and uh, pose your question for... Uh, Manchester. Actually, two passing through the James look back when you're looking at remuneration and how you type an HMI. Uh, it's quite clear that I think it was a necessary adjustment to get the people at the bottom of the service probably suffered the worst. But we're getting increasing reports of the media that people at the top of the service are allocating monies to themselves outside of the salary structure. Do you think that the HMI has a role in dealing with this, or is this a local issue? Well, I, um, I haven't, it's not a local issue. Um, I'd like to see the evidence that people at the top of the service are allocating money to themselves. I'm talking about where people are getting packages about cars, uh, and I just think it, it might <laughs> I just think it might be part of the integrity issue that's at stake here when people are arrogating so much money at the very top of the service that it actually plays into the integrity agenda and I wonder what HMI could do about that well um, one of the things that has struck me about the job that I now have is that there is nothing in the way in which the police service operates which is outside our remit. Because as I mentioned since 1856 and, and it continues today, we are concerned with the efficiency and effectiveness of the police. So how the police operates, including its financial efficiency, is within our jurisdiction in terms of report, you know, making judgments, assessments and reporting what we think of it. So in theory, it's within our jurisdiction. Um, I haven't seen any evidence, but I'd be glad to have it. Uh, if people are um, securing financial um, settlements by their own hand, which are outside the terms of police regulations, point one. Point two, I doubt they're doing it by their own hand. I think they're doing it after negotiation with their police and crime commissioner. And therefore, the police and crime commissioner is answerable to the electorate as to whether or not he or she is allocating um, uh, unduly generous or inappropriate or even unlawful amounts of money to senior officers. And that is something that should be subject to public scrutiny in a way that probably it wouldn't have been in the days of police authorities, which were much more invisible and um, you know, below the public's radar. Well, so if, 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 if inappropriate things are happening, it does go to integrity if people are violating police regulations. One from uh, me, if I may. I'm sure everyone in this room, Tom, uh, would welcome the initiative of, of taking some kind of action and looking at the state, if you, if you can call it that, of, of domestic abuse in this country and sexual exploitation uh, of children. But as you yourself acknowledge, and as you acknowledge in your report about you know, value for police money, et cetera, et cetera, a couple of months ago, Where's that money, where are those resources going to come from? Where's the money going to come from for the new technology you say is so urgently required? Where are the police numbers going to come from when, as you, you yourself acknowledge, numbers will continue to be put back? In such a sensitive area, who's going to lose out if that's going to be accommodated? Technology uh, has the opportunity to provide very significant increased effectiveness and efficiency in policing. We all know this. I reckon there's nobody in this room and probably nobody in the superintending ranks who would deny that if it were possible to introduce some of the most advanced technologies, which are used by many other uh, public services and private services already today. Nobody's talking about inventing new things. It's just applying them in the police. If you could apply the best tomorrow, you would grab it. Because what matters is not police numbers, with some exceptions, for example, public order situations, what matters is what the police do. We have in our inspection program for 2013-14 um, uh, an inspection, which hasn't yet started, but it will start very shor shortly, called Making Best Use of Police Time. And technology is an absolutely critical part of that. I believe, and I've said this before in public, that the state of police technology in some, um, in some and too many respects, is absolutely woeful. I think that if the public knew just how dysfunctional police technology is, they would be shocked. I think they think that it's all a bit like spooks. Well, it's, it's not. 
uh, but it could be far, far better. Yeah, there, are, there are over 2,300 different IT systems yeah. across the 43 forces, many of which require multiple handling of information. They don't talk to one another, and they're in the dark ages. I came from um, one of the largest law firms in the world, operating internationally, and when I saw the state of police technology, I was truly shocked. I was pretty shocked about what I saw in the Home Office as well. But there is a, a very critical point there about efficiency and effectiveness of making the police officers who are in the service as efficient as possible. But can you acquire that technology, given the cutbacks that you, uh, that you still say are absolutely necessary, can you acquire that, uh, that technology and still preserve the police officer numbers required to actually use it? Because Yes, I think you can. Uh, because the providers of technology, provided they are providing to uh, an intelligent client, well-resourced client, probably operating across several police services or even, mul or even a, a, a single procurement agency operating for all of the police, rather than the fragmented system that we have at the moment. Those technology suppliers, acknowledging the pressure on police budgets, will be able to cut a deal with you so that the costs are going to be spread over an affordable period of time. Okay. Gentlemen, that tells you your answer, and put, put your questions to Tom Winter. I'll check it's on this time. Paul Phillips um, from Northampton Police. Uh, the question I have is, obviously, as you are the voice of uh, the customer, quite rightly inspecting the police, how will you ensure that you do that in a way that creates as little additional pressure to the forces that are being inspected? Information is the oxygen of accountability, and nobody argues that the police should not be accountable. What we must do is to ensure that as we design our inspection programs, we do it in a way which is going to minimize the burden on police resources. Now, there are a number of ways we can do that. One, we are designing new technology and approaches. Um, we will pilot, for most of our um, thematic reports, we will pilot uh, the approach that we're going to take in one or two forces before we do all 43 so that we learn the lessons and make sure that when we go to the other forces, we're doing it in the most efficient and effective way. And also we will, as far as possible, try to ensure that when the HMIC inspectors come to a force, if they have the appropriate professional expertise, and of course we have experts in all sorts of areas, then they can do the inspection, more than one inspection, in one visit. Those are ways in which we can minimise the burden on police resources. Okay, we have a question uh, down here. To stand up if you would, sir, and tell us who you are. Uh, hello, uh, Dave, Dave Walton, Hertfordshire. Um, can I just ask a question, please, about police and crime commissioners? Um, I'd be interested to hear to what extent you feel there's a case for police and crime commissioners being brought under your remit of inspection activities which would perhaps um, help to better inform the public uh, about how they perform when, when they come to um, re-elect or not? Um, it, it, it's a possible model, but it's one that Parliament has just rejected. Under the Police Reform and Social Responsibility Act 2011, the power of HMIC, the obligation of HMIC to inspect and report upon the efficiency and effectiveness of police authorities was abolished and not carried forward to police and crime commissioners. And Parliament's decision was that the police and crime commissioners will be accountable principally to the electorate and, of course, to the law, and that they will not require inspection by an independent inspectorate. That is the will of Parliament. And I think that we have to give Parliament's will a chance to work first. However, I've also said publicly, and I'm happy to repeat it here now, there is nothing in the Police Reform Social Responsibility Act or any of the other police legislation which says that if HMIC comes to the conclusion that the efficiency and effectiveness of a police force has been impaired, hindered, jeopardized, diminished, because of the decision of a police and crime commissioner that we should not say so. After all, we will say so if it is decisions of the Home Office or the Health Service or Education or Social Services or anyone else. If we think that their decisions have impaired the efficiency and effectiveness of the police, we will say so. There is no darkened room with a locked door called police and crime commissioner can't go in. So if we think that the police and crime commissioner has done that and that the 
chief has been unable to achieve the appropriate efficiency and effectiveness, we will do so. I don't know whether the police and crime commissioners welcome that statement, but that's the way it's going to be. I think that probably answers your question, sir. Um, if there's no more from the floor, just one more from me. I'm sorry to keep harping back to the money, Tom. But, you know, you have acknowledged in your report a couple of months ago that a lot of forces are doing well in making the cutbacks that you've asked for. Uh, and one or two in particular, I think you cite, Bedfordshire and Lincolnshire, have made big, big cuts. And they're now facing real difficulty in making any more. Bearing in mind everything you've said today, what's your suggestion for their next move? What, what should they do? How, how do they resolve this? The judgments that HMIC makes in relation to every individual force are context sensitive and fact specific. And Bedfordshire and Lincolnshire uh, as very small forces which have already achieved a great deal and are because of their size have, con have significant difficulties in achieving much more. Um, those need to be, that needs to be fully taken into account. We cannot expect the impossible. However, there are ways in which even those forces will be able to explore and maybe exploit opportunities. And one of the things in the VTP3, the Value in the Police 3 uh, report that we published in July, is the case for collaboration and the advantages of collaboration, not just with different uh, one police force with another, but with other agencies in the private sector and in the public sector. The case for collaboration is still a strong one. So we will be... Uh, of course mindful of the individual circumstances of those forces. That leads into a debate which I doubt we're not going to have here today uh, as to whether or not there are too many police forces. Yeah, but what about those like, for so example, and again you quote West Yorkshire and South Yorkshire who have made, made short-term savings but not long-term savings. What are you going to be doing, what are you going to be recommending they should do in the next 12 months? What impact is that going to have on the service they provide for the public? Um, it's, uh, the principles of um, inspection and reporting on the efficiency and effectiveness of the police are very much the same as the principles of regulation of other safety critical um, monopoly uh, services to the public. Uh, the police service needs to understand, just as other services do, what is the condition, capacity, capability, serviceability, performance and security of supply of their assets. Those assets, of course, are in the most complex of all in the case of the police service because they are people. However, there are opportunities in West Yorkshire and South Yorkshire to learn from other police forces that have made greater efficiencies and, and, and strides in effectiveness and that um, in the uh, economic regulatory field, one of the things that we had with great advantage is comparability. And the Yorkshires that we've mentioned, West and South, the Yorkshires have the opportunity to learn from the good practice in other parts of the country. And if they don't? And I believe that they will. If they don't? Well, if they don't, then they're accountable to their police and crime commissioners. That's the fact. And they're accountable to their public. And their public, the people of a police force area, which is underperforming, which is not achieving the highest degrees of efficiency and effectiveness for the money in, in question, are going to be restive they're going to be holding them to account. And the police and crime commissioner is going to be coming under pressure because people in one police force area, let's not mention the Yorkshires, but one police force area are going to be saying, you know, it costs X pounds to deal with a burglary or a particular piece of antisocial behaviour or whatever, you know, as the statistics are presented. Why does it cost X plus five in our area? Because we're getting less policing for our money. We don't want to be paying more for the same quality of service or even a lesser quality of service. So comparability is extremely important. And the PCCs are the ones who will hold the chief to account. One final question for me, because our audience are su surprisingly reluctant, but I'll speak up on their behalf, I hope correctly. Um, you say it's, it is good news, obviously, that, that crime is down, customer satisfaction is up. But on the front line, you are 6,000 officers, or around 6,000 officers down. Given the cuts that you're still ha are advocating, with, that are still brought in for various forces, is that going to be maintained? Is what going to be maintained? The good is news, the, the crime down, customer satisfaction up, given that there are around 6,000 less police officers on the front line. Um, the front line has been protected, but not preserved. In other words, the proportion of police officers in police, a in police force areas, with very few exceptions, has actually gone up but the overall numbers, as you've said, has gone down. I repeat the point I made earlier. What matters is not how many cops you've got, but what do they do? Okay. I'm, any more, I'm 
it's your last chance. We have one lady right. Quickly, because we're, we're way over time. Uh, stand up if you would, uh, madam, and tell us who you are. And this will be the last question before we uh, take a coffee break. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's uh, Sophie Wood, uh, representing the National Trans Police Association. But in my day job, I actually educate officers and detectives how to um, investigate internet crime and use data communications. And I'm just wondering, uh, in order to move a detective constable from a position of Luddite towards Uber Geek, which is the referencing that we use on our course, takes a great deal of resource in terms of IT procurement and uh, education. Do you think you can realistically set uh, parameters and recommendations to the police service currently to <coughs> meet those needs when the resources simply aren't there? Okay, John? The chief constables must find the efficiencies and effectiveness is from, uh, and higher effectiveness, and that is for them operationally to do. HMIC does not prescribe and certainly does not have the power to give directions to a chief in relation to how the resources are made. Um, it is undoubtedly true that some officers are more resistant to new technology than are others. But is it not your experience? Certainly, uh, this is the information that I receive as I go around the country and my fellow inspectors of constabulary, is that uh, younger officers are eager to use modern technology, and indeed they're much more uh, attuned to modern technology than some of their seniors. And what happens in so many cases is they come to work and lock in their lockers a very powerful handheld computer called a smartphone and then they take some brick, which was you know, issued I don't know, years and years ago, uh, which has had most of its functionality taken off it, you know, dangerous technology like a camera, and that's been taken <laughs> off it, so that it can, uh, and they go out with that uh, just weighing them down. Um, I think that younger officers um, are eager to embrace new technology, but there will be some older officers who are resistant to it. I, um, had an extremely encouraging presentation from officers from Hampshire not so long ago. Uh, and they are, as many of you will know, as all of you will know, um, one of the most um, uh, um, messianic forces in terms of new technology, body-worn videos, digital uh, recording, handheld devices, and so on. Others, like South Wales are, and Cambridgeshire, are, are also making considerable um, um, strides in this respect, and the Met and others. Um, and what they said was, um, we are providing this technology uh, to a very high standard, but it is, there is still a, a level of resistance. If the sergeant um, in charge of a shift is up for the new technology, everybody will be using it and they'll be glad they're using it because it can just save so much time and mean that they can do more policing and less messing about in the police station using outdated and, and antiquated uh, systems. But if the sergeant on the very next shift is a bit more of a whistle and notebook sort of person, then the constables in question will be certainly not encouraged to use the new technology and may even be discouraged to use the new technology. So even in forces where technology is you know, one of the sort of number one things amongst the senior management, it still needs to filter downwards and to get take up from the people at the front line. And that is a question of just explaining the, the, the power of mo modern technology and getting people to use it. Yes, resources are being restricted, but let us also remember over 80% of the costs of the police service, as I mentioned in my speech, are spent on pay, and, pay, and, pay salaries and, and allowances. And a relatively small proportion is spent on things like cars and technology. Now, if that technology can unlock much greater efficiency and effectiveness, then it would be a unwise chief constable who said, I just can't afford it. He's got to be able to find it because new technology can do wonderful things. And the people in question, once you've dissolved some of these embolisms of resistance, they'll get it and policing will be better.